Welcome to The Whistleblower. My name is Ian Trent and joining me is today's outstanding panel of water polo illuminaries. It was legends last week and now it's illuminaries. The former FINA referee is in Sydney. He joins us now, Phil Bauer. Hi, Phil. Hi, Ian. How are you? Very well, thank you. Now, we're going down to lockdown in Melbourne and Australia's top referee, Danny Flav. Hi, Dan. How, how are you coping with the lockdown and all of the hoo-ha with it all? You know, we're, we're getting closer to, to getting our freedom. Another couple of weeks and uh, hopefully the way the, uh, the count's going downwards in the right direction, we might be allowed to out of our house. So, can you just turn yourself up a little bit there? Sure, mate. I can do that. Okay. So you Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, still you're still a bit soft. So you're still locked up, are you? Yes, mate, still locked up. Uh, probably another three weeks to go. And uh, we should be right after that, hopefully. Fantastic. Okay. And the, the Pies, they lost again. But I'm not talking football tonight because those Bombers, they are disgraceful. Okay. Yes. Phil's happy with the Roosters, uh, as usual. Okay. Who do you follow, Keisha? The Swans. Oh, that, they did particularly well this week. Oh, that's a rookie good. panellist, a rookie panellist and a footy fan to Australian women's team champion. Welcome, Keisha Gophers. Thank you. Happy to be involved. Happy to be here. All right. And how's your time off been? Or well, not time off, but time, strange time. Is that <laughs> months has been really strange. Think, what yeah, strange time is a good way to put it. You know, it's, um, it's a bit of a, a pivot to what we're normally doing, but I think that's, I kind of love um, you know, a bit of a change of scenery. So you've got to make the most of it. And that's what we're trying to do out at Enswiss. So, um, yeah, no, it's been okay. We're trying to just keep positive and make the most of the situation and keep training hard so that when, when we do get to those Olympic Games, we are ready to go and haven't left anything um, unsure or undone. And so um, you're out at Enswiss how often a week? Yes, yeah, so we're, we're there every morning, um, twice a day, Twice, like two sessions in the morning with gym and pool, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then just the pool session on the Tuesday, Thursday. Okay. Good yeah. stuff. Good to mm -hmm. see you keeping busy. So you don't, <laughs> you don't work at all? Um, I actually work for Waterfall Australia with the alumni program. Of course. So part time job, and I'm also a florist. So if you've got any, you know, Sue might like a, a bouquet every now and again. So if you, um, you know, I, I'm at your service if you'd like to hire me for that. <laughs> Who has seen your flowers and they are magnificent. Now, you, mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned the alumni. Tell us a bit more about that program. Yeah, so that's uh, a, a new um, reinvigorated program. Basically, Waterpolo Australia's initiative to reconnect, re-engage alumni. So that's, that's players, that's squad members, that's coaches, staff, referees. Um, definitely shout out to the referees. We're looking for you guys to... Um, be involved in the alumni program just to reconnect and you know get people back into the sport and also to like share all the amazing things that our alumni get up to um, because there are just heaps of amazing stories out there uh, well beyond the athletic careers of alumni so you know I'm super passionate about it because I just think the more I look into it the more outstanding and incredible achievements that there are to share and I really want people to who have given heaps, given a lot to the sport of water polo, to come back and uh, enjoy, uh, you know, what's going on now and be involved in the community and and um, have that support, especially in these, as you mentioned, strange times. They are strange. And Phil's forgot to turn himself on again. Phil forgot to unmute himself. That's great, Alicia. Oh, sorry, Keisha. Uh, so how, how, how much of a day does that take you? I mean, you train every morning, then what, do you go to the Australian Water Polo office or do you just go home and start working? No, yeah, I'm um, able to just work from home. Uh, so, but yeah, we're basically out at Homebush most of the morning. So I get home around 12, um, have lunch. <laughs> Very important part of the day, have lunch. And um, then, um, and then, yeah, do a little bit of work on the alumni, depending on, depending on how the, Mood takes me, I suppose. Sometimes I work on Mondays and Tuesdays, sometimes Thursdays, Fridays. It's great to, um, in these COVID times, to be flexible. <laughs> it's great. 
French times, like we said. Now, if you'd like to uh, ask Keisha a question or the referee uh, panel of Phil and Danny, look at your Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen, right? Just press it and write your question and we'll get it on for you. Okay, um, so it's that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Or if you'd like, when we uh, have our special guest just shortly, Alicia Smith, Ian, ask her a question, please. No, I, can't, I can't hear nothing. I can't see anything, mate. You've gone. We can hear I'm you. Gonna to, I'm going to have to log out and log back in again. Okay, well, Danny's going to leave us for just, 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 just a little bit. Okay. Mate, yeah. if you can hear me, put your thumb up and I'll log out and log back in again. Okay, I've got to jump out. Right. He'll get his technical gurus in Melbourne and get him back on there. Okay. Now, so audience questions. Yeah, your Q&A box down there. If you'd like to email us, it's <laughs> polo at gmail.com. And uh, the Instagram address is whistleblowerpolo at who is TWB, the whistleblower. Okay. There it is on your screen. And we'd like to hear from you. Uh, is that survey still going, Phil? Yes, Ian, the survey's still going. The link's on uh, Australian Water Polo website. Okay. So if anybody has a comment to make about the show, we've, please do. We've, had, we've had some really interesting comments, actually. Yep. Okay. Uh, have they been constructive? They've, uh, uh, every comment's constructive. It depends how you look at them. But, yeah, they have been. Yes. Have and hopefully with Keisha, with Keisha on the show, we've... Uh, looked at and uh, reacted to a couple of the comments. Good. Ah. Okay. I see. Uh, <laughs> while we're waiting for um, Danny to get back to us. Keisha, have you got any, any news from Sydney Uni Club? You've been, they, they're training, aren't they? Yeah, we're uh, training. So Duri is training the National League squad and there's some junior teams also training. I know the men's, men's team is also Training, um, I think it's less about the competition or whatever it might yeah. be. You're more about getting together, getting people active, you know, uh, touching base with each other and just um, keeping as fit as possible. Um, yeah, I think, you know, there's, it's been previously hard to do training. So I think everyone was itching to just get back and do something um, to, you know, less, less about, you know, um, being as fit as you possibly can be and more about getting everyone together and having a good time playing water polo, which is always a good thing. That's what it's all about. Have you got any friends uh, overseas that, you know, uh, are affected by the virus? How are they going? Well, um, it's, it's interesting. I think I played in Greece last year, so I um, have a lot of friends over in Greece and... And sometimes I'll, you know, see them doing things like they would have done. Oh, you know, and Arnie, of course, is in Spain. Um, but, you know, travelling to different countries and doing things that I think are well beyond the realms of possibility. Um, so it's, you know, it's uh, interesting. I don't really know how what's happening over there because... It seems like it's all normal sometimes. But at the same time, they've got their own um, concerns and issues about, you know, the Olympics, qualifying for the Olympics. How does that even work? How does that happen? Um, what does their next international competition look like? Same as what we have over here. So while some things are very different, they can, they can travel between countries and we can't travel between states, um, other concerns are very much the same. Well, I, I did notice Arnie Espar was uh, holidaying in Greece. So you'd get out of Spain, because Greece has been pretty good, I believe. They're, mm. uh, they're sort of a little bit like us, I think. Um, and Spain, we all know about Spain, Italy, France. They've not been good there. Arnie, she just hightails it over to Greece. No worries at all. We can't even get, you know, up to Queensland. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, but it is interesting what other countries are doing. Like, I know Canada just had a long camp. Altogether, um, I think their restrictions are relatively strict. Um, so they decided to have a camp and then they're now home. But um, and then I think America might be doing something completely different. It's all just, you know, based on the situation 
of your country and what you think is best for your team in the moment. Mm. Okay. Well, uh, Phil, we may as well uh, go. Why don't we go to the rules now or would you like to do that later? We're just missing a panellist here and he's a vital yeah. one. Let's let's uh, go to our special guest and Why come back to, to the rules if we have time later. I think that'd be the way to go, Ian. Let's let's do that. And um, this lady is a former dual Olympian. Right? Went to the Beijing and London Olympics. One of our all-time great goalkeepers, and she's also won a couple of national league titles as a coach. And she joins us now from. Beautiful Canoundra. And it's a big welcome to Alicia Smith. Hi, Alicia. How are you doing? Hi. Good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Oh, absolute pleasure. Okay. It's all about you for a little while. <laughs> okay. Alicia Smith, born in Helensburg, or at least lived there when you were very, very young. Yeah, moved there when I was two and a half. Helensburg does not, and water polo, they don't seem to, you know, go hand in hand. How did you start? Sure. So I guess Helensburg's not far from the coast and I was doing surf. Then to get stronger for surf, I was doing swim training. And this fun thing next to swim training was being played with a ball. Um, so after a bit of inquiry, I found out more about water polo. And, and through family and friends, um, the Bedwells, who both... Well, lots of their children played in national teams. Um, they got me involved with water polo and I started playing when I went to Kiriwe High School. Right, so what made you a goalkeeper, Alicia? Um, are, you, so are, are you one of those special people that just like to get in there? I mean, we all know goalkeepers are a little bit strange. So not special enough to choose the position. Uh, so my first coach was Mel Bedwell. And we were actually all rotating through goals. Uh, it was my turn, funnily enough, Sydney Uni Mini was my turn to be in goals. And after I played in goals that night, she said, that's it, you stay there. Okay. I think it was the aggression that kept me in my position. Seemed to me that was a reasonable, uh, reasonably pertinent sort of move. And uh, well done, Mel. Okay, so uh, goalkeeping as a junior. Look, I remember you in it as an under-16 and whatever, and you couldn't get enough of it, right? Did you instantly fall in love with goalkeeping? Um, I don't know. I feel like uh, as a junior, there were times that I wanted to get out and play on the field. Uh, but I think, luckily enough for me, for school, I was playing on the field. And then, obviously, on a weekend playing for Cronulla, I was in goals. So getting the best of both worlds, really. Um, and I think it was more a fact that Everyone else was too scared to be in goals and I quite enjoyed having everyone peg balls at me. Um, and it was the competition of, you know, being able to stop someone that I enjoyed. So that's why I stayed there. So in, in the early days, Alicia, coming up, so through under 16s, in all your junior polo, who are your most influential coaches and people around you? Yeah, I guess um, I had brew for a very long time um, coming through Cronulla. And uh, for me, it was all about fun with him. Um, and then we obviously had brew also for national junior stuff. So I didn't have a lot of different coaches um, coming along. For me, I guess I looked up to the Bedwells so much and Mel got me involved and I always looked up to her and the family was just amazing with me. Um, so, yeah, I, I took a, a lot of feedback and things from those around me, but I didn't really have anyone that I inspired to look up to. Uh, it wasn't until a little bit later on, um, and I was doing some work with Liz Weeks, that, you know, then she's what I wanted to be. Um, and happy to say that we're still friends today. So, coming up, did apart from playing state championships and national in a, as a junior, in Cronulla, did you... In your era, did you play under 16s, under 14s, or did you go straight to grade? I didn't play 14s. Um, I didn't start playing until I went to high school, so I was already 15 when I actually started playing. 
So I played under 16s. Um, we also, I think it was just as I got out of 16s, they had Phillies, which was the 18s, um, which I played for club. Uh, whilst playing 16s and 18s, I started in third grade, second grade, first grade. Um, that's how my progression pretty much went. Um, and then obviously International League when it started happening for women. So who was there before you, um, Alicia? Was it Karen Kerr? Yeah. Was she, was she the first grade goalie before you? Um, not, when, not when I was um, trying to get into first grade. So Amber Lum was the first grade goalkeeper. Okay. So, and then um, unfortunately for Amber, she had a very bad um, car accident. So that kind of gave me um, a chance to start playing first grade. Um, otherwise, I probably would have sat behind her for a lot longer. Alrighty. And I know that your parents were a big, big support. I remember Ronnie used to drive you all over around the world, didn't he? Yeah. So dad took me everywhere I needed to go where uh, mum held down the house at home and looked after my little brother. Um, at one stage there, I didn't see dad for oh, a lot of time other than him driving me somewhere because he was working four jobs to essentially be able to afford for us as a family to live, but also to send me everywhere I needed to go. Um, I mean, I look at what it cost back then for me to do what I did, um, and I don't know how parents afford it these days. Um, Maka, I actually remember your brother from Beijing, because him and I and Blaze, uh, the Santa Maria do siblings who were a little sibling gang um we were in the stands and you know he he was a he was cheering loudly and having a great time with the rest of us with your you know beijing experience or the lead up what what can you say about that like the memories or the you know not necessarily games itself but leading up to it making your first olympic team um you know the struggle the the highlights tell us i guess um I, I did the lead up to uh, Athens beforehand um, and obviously didn't get to go to that. But seeing what it meant to everyone as they kind of made the team and took off and, and watching that from home, um, that whole four year cycle for me in the lead up to Beijing uh, was important. Had many, many ups and downs. Um, yeah, didn't, didn't enjoy a lot of the ride, um, but saw the outcome that was there to achieve. And then once I'd made the team, um, it was all one step at a time and tried to soak up absolutely everything I could because I didn't know if I'd ever be in that situation again. Um, I do get asked a lot about how I feel about the Olympics and I guess um, going in, wanting to win gold, knowing that um, us and America were one, two all the way leading up and then we come away with a bronze. While we finished on a high winning something, um, I feel like we didn't achieve what we wanted and I didn't achieve a goal. So I still have this bittersweet, loved that I made an Olympic team, hated that I never came away with a gold. Um, that's how I felt at the end of Beijing. And that was kind of my drive for London. Um, unfortunately, ended the same way. And uh, I had already chose to retire. Previous to the London Games starting, I had chose to retire post London and uh, start my new life. And do you feel still that bittersweet or do you think because, you know, you were able to, to do something amazing, you know, compete at two Olympics, have two bronze medals, that it's, and like also back up from, from a disappointment, which <coughs> anyone else around the country, I'm sure around the world would not see as that, but be able to back up and bounce back um, and then go through another Olympics, put yourself through something that, you know, did hurt you potentially so much the first time round. Do you see that? I mean, look, I, I mean, maybe I'm answering for you, but I see that as an amazing achievement. So how do you feel about the Olympics plural now? Uh, I still feel the same way. Still a bit of sweet. <laughs> um, what is off my pep talk? Funnily enough, um, people will say, oh, how do you feel about winning at the Olympics? I'm like, well, a bronze is, yes, winning slightly. It's not winning. Um, so, yeah, I still didn't achieve a goal. Um, so I still, I don't have any regrets, um, but I have disappointment. Um, and I can look at the journey now and see what it's given me. Um, really funny, actually, some people, I didn't have it on my resume when I was 
trying to get a job out here. Not many jobs in the country, I can tell you that much. Um, and then it wasn't until then my husband said to me, you have to put the Olympics on your resume. Like it says so much about the way you lived your life. Um, and now once I did put it on my resume and I got asked in the interview, why is it in this tiny little corner that you went to an Olympics? And I guess, yeah, it, it, it is something that I achieved and it is amazing. Um, but yeah, at the same time, there is that, that little bit of pain that just lingers there because there is no gold medal. So Alicia, as a goalkeeper, yeah, there's two of you in a team. Uh, and how did, uh, did, you, did you play in the bronze medal game in Beijing? I know you did in London and we'll get to that. But how hard is it to sit and watch and be a great teammate knowing you're going to be sitting on the bench for a full game and, that, and you're, you, know, you want the other goalie to do really well, but you'd also be longing to get in and take a place? Yeah, I guess um, in Beijing, uh, Dumba had swapped us out a little bit um, during the rounds and it wasn't a given that you would play a full game. So the whole time I did sit on the edge of my seat, wishing and hoping that I might get a chance. And it's not that you want the other goalkeeper to play poorly because obviously you want to win. So you need everyone firing on all cylinders. But at the same time, you want to get your, your slice of the pie, I guess. Um, and it was, it, it was an interesting feeling at the end of the game because you've just won a bronze medal at your first Olympics, but you didn't actually play for it. Um, so I came away from Beijing in the last game we lost. So we lost. I, I lost a game to get to the gold medal match is how I felt about it. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 was, it was hard. Um, but at the same time, we wouldn't have got to that point had we not all have played the whole week anyway. So, yeah, you, you are a part of the bronze medal, but you're not. So... We'll get to London, because not everyone will know what actually happened in London in the bronze medal game. But you went from, if you can explain it, and it really shows your character where a horrendous mistake, and then you, then, you win, then you win the game for the team. Yeah, look, um, I, I do tell the joke that I wasn't ready to retire, but um, really it came down to the fact that it was loud um, and I was trying to find the free player in the pool. And while I was looking around, um, cause two players that had um, spread widest um, that I both looked at, both had someone really tight on them on the lane rope. Um, and I wanted to make a safe pass. You know what, should have just given it to someone on the lane rope and made them deal with the, the situation. But um, whilst looking to make a safe pass, there was someone swimming underwater, which no one was aware of and I think because there was only a few seconds left everyone on the bench was so excited and screaming already that we'd won and as we all know you don't um, think that you've won it until that final whistle blows so um, the ball was taken off me and pushed in the goals um, ending you know normal time going into extra time um, Dumper was really good with me um, he could have dragged me easily could have dragged me in that situation um, but I, I won't use the words he used, but he pretty much told <laughs> me to get in there and do it. Um, and you know what? It was Mel Rippon and Kate Ginther who turned around to me and said, you've got this. You'll be a brick wall. You'll bring everything down. Don't worry about it. We'll score you a goal. And Beattie said, I've got it. I'll score you the goal. And that was it. It was those three. They, they turned around to me and just said, you've got it. Um, I can't say that everyone in the team felt that way, but it only needed to be one player that turned to me and said that. And it just gives you enough to know that you've got to do it for the team. Um, yeah. So fortunately enough for me, we did score and uh, they didn't. So two times in a row that uh, Hungary went down to us and didn't win the bronze medal. So Maka, in, in that game, in the last 10 seconds, which unfortunately thing happened, did you think the players didn't want the ball or they thought, that, as you said, they thought you had God's already won and you were in control, in, in control of the ball and didn't need to pass? Is no, right? no um, I think I don't, I, I haven't watched it back, Danny. Like there's okay. been, there, I've, I've seen like snippets of it on different things that have been on Facebook and whatever, but I haven't watched the game back. Um, I don't know who the free player was and I probably don't want to know who the free player was. Um, 
but the like I was looking for furthest away and widest from the goal. Um, and there was, there wasn't that long. Like when you think about how long that is, it, it's not a long time. And as a goalkeeper, you usually are pretty safe in that scenario. Um, mind you, I have seen it happen nearly to other goalkeepers who I've screamed at from the side of the pool since thinking, how have you not learnt from my mistake? Um, but yeah, look, I, I think everyone wanted it, but at the same time, I wasn't prepared to give it yeah. to a player who was heavily marked. Fair enough. So Alicia, what advice would you give to young goalkeepers about making mistakes in general, right? And if you make an absolute clangor, you know, what should your mind uh, process be going through to make it better? I mean, it's really hard. Like if you make a simple error that's your fault, you've just got to own it. Um, if it's a goal that's going in and you're the last line of defence and it's got through six others, then, you know, you know you've done everything you can. Um, that was a huge mistake and it could have gone completely the opposite way um, when we went into extra time. And I was really lucky it didn't because I really don't know how mentally I would have coped if it didn't um, go the way that it did. So it, it's a hard one to say because I can sit here now that my scenario played out the way that I needed it to and say, oh, you know, you can get over it and um, learn from your mistakes and things like that. But to be completely honest, I don't know mentally how I would have been had it not gone that way. So it, it's a hard one. But the goalkeeper is the last line of defence. So it has had to pass through everybody else first. Um, the, the player that shoots that last goal should have had someone marking them anyway. Um, so yeah, you're only as good as, as an individual as your team is together. Hey, Mackie, if only the, uh, the new rules, how they are now, where if the goal has got the ball, you virtually can't touch them. Yep. <laughs> and then it wouldn't have been a problem. Yeah, very true. Um, but then, yeah, I guess, it, it, it could happen to anyone though. Yeah. So it could have, if I could have passed it to a field player, I could have swum out away from my goals so that I was protecting the ball and, and moving away from the goals and, and then given it to a field player. And then they could have had it taken off them and it could have been thrown in the goals. So the scenario can still happen. It just won't happen to a goalkeeper, <laughs> so, which I'm very thankful that no one will go through that anymore. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it could happen to anyone. And I would, yeah. I would say the same thing to a field player that, you know, the, the team needs to protect you and protect the ball um, in that situation, especially if you think you've got it all tied up and there's not long left, um, that that ball becomes so precious. Yeah. Aka, what are your favourite things or favourite thing about the Olympic Games, your highlight? Um, yeah, wow. It, it's really hard to say uh, a favourite thing because you think of so many different things that happen throughout the week or two weeks. Um, like walking out in the opening ceremony is amazing and we were lucky enough to do it twice. Um, Dumper let us do it both times. It was our decision and both times we chose to do it. Um, down to your first game, down to, you know, winning a game in a penalty shootout, to the final game where you win a medal, to walking around the village and seeing all the different athletes from sports that you never thought you would interact with. Um, to seeing your parents in the stands who have put so much time, effort, money into your achievement also. Um, it's just I couldn't put my finger on one thing that is more special than anything else. Okay. And we like to talk about refereeing at the, in this show. <laughs> Does anything stand out about both of those Olympics refereeing-wise to you? Um, as a goalkeeper, probably not. Um, I don't, I don't need to get angry at the referee because I haven't just got smashed and look up and think, why did I not get anything from that? So I, I don't know. I don't ever really think too much about the referees as a player, as a goalkeeper, um, vastly different as a coach. Um, it comes into my planning of the game, but as a player, I never even considered really who the referee was or what they were doing because I was a goalkeeper. So you decided to retire after 2012. What did you do? Um, straight after, not much. Um, I, did, I did go and coach Cronulla um, National League. 
Um, cause I wanted to give back a little bit, um, cause I'd been given so much from the sport. So that was, I started working at Water Polo Australia and coaching for Cronulla and that's what I was really doing. Um, so was that your first coaching gig, Cronulla National League? Um, I actually, the year I had surgery, so I had surgery at the end of 2009. So I coached the 2010 season because I couldn't play. Um, so that was my first coaching. Um, that was much harder because I was coaching my peers. Yeah. Uh, so I'd gone straight from directly playing with them to coaching them to the next year, playing with them again. Um, that would, was probably the hardest year I've ever coached. That's a tough gig, first up. First coaching yeah. gig ever, nationally. Yeah, it was. Um, I did have, I had a lot of guidance. Um, luckily for me, um, it was really, it was Dumper that wanted me to coach. Um, and he did sit on the side during games and give me a, a little bit of advice here and there um, on what I should be doing as a coach. Because I was, I was in the deep end, really. Um, I'd, I'd obviously coached junior teams before, but that's really all about fun and kids having a, a good time. Um, but yeah, when it, when it came to national league, it's, it's very different. Uh, so it was, was difficult, but I would say that the second time round I coached Cronulla, I had learned lessons, um, did it a, a little bit of a different way. Uh, but yeah, I only, only stayed coaching for the one season. Um, and at the end of that season, I announced my pregnancy. So I was pregnant with my first child, so um, the following year, Cronulla decided to get a different coach. So that was it for me, um, coaching down there. But then the story gets much better. So you <laughs> started to play for Sydney Uni, and yeah. tell us how did that happen? How did that come about? So um, actually, Leah was, had a niggly injury. Um, so that would have been the 2013 season, I think it would. Oh, no, maybe 2014. 2014. Yeah. So, yeah, Leah had a niggly injury and uh, Ian here gave me a call and said, if Leah goes down, will you come play for us? Well, no one else had asked me to play so or coach or do anything of the sort. So I thought, oh, yeah, sure. Why not? thought, yeah, Leah will be fine. Um, a month, six weeks later, I got a call saying, so Leah's leg's fine, but she's just broken her thumb. Can you come play? Uh, so, yeah, so that, that was a Saturday that, that Ian called me and uh, Sydney Uni were up in Newcastle doing the Saturday-Sunday hit-out. Um, so the following Tuesday night, I turned up to training, um, killed myself because I hadn't been in water in about, oh, I think it was 10 months or something since I'd even Good dipped in a pool. You were great. <laughs> but, yeah, so then, then played out the rest of that season with you guys. Yeah, that was awesome. Which was good. Fantastic. Great. And, 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 and won, a bronze, uh, won a bronze medal that year? Yeah, yeah, we did. Um, I do dare say, though, if Leah had been playing, it would have been a different outcome. Um, yes, Balmain would have won huh. the bronze medal. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I, I have to, I to think say, that Phil, that we, we did play you in, the, uh, in that bronze medal game. And, oh, well, it was nice and tight. Sorry, Phil. We couldn't score a goal. <laughs> we could not score a goal. Must have been yeah. a good keeper. And the defenders in front of her, but you had some you had some nice players in your team though, Phil. Some good names, some veterans. Yeah, we had some superstars, and no one could put the ball past Alicia. It was. That's because they were all too scared to throw it at me. If they actually had to put a good shot on, they would have scored. Yeah, you had them psyched out, but that's a <laughs> that's what a good goalkeeper does. Yep. Very true. Yeah. So. Uh, we won't get into your coaching of Sydney Uni just yet. Tell us, you won two National League titles as a player, correct? Both of Cronulla? Yep. So one in 2006? Six and 12. Yeah. What was the difference between those two premierships? Um, so I got injured um, in six. Um, so I actually uh, broke a finger um, and was not allowed to play, um, even though I thought I could. Um, it was told not to play because obviously we had bigger and better things coming up nationally. So um, with me not being able to play, uh, there wasn't really anyone else to play for Cronulla. So Kaz Kerr got invited back uh, to play. And Kaz was really nervous because she felt like, you know, it was beyond her. But I can tell you what, she came back and there was a passion and a love for the game from her that just went through the team. Um, and I think that that was really important 
to get us where we needed to be. Because that was back in the day where uh, you played three games to win. So every um, round, it was the best of three. And unfortunately, Phil, again, we played I mean, mm. um, <laughs> in that playoff. We won the first game. <laughs> you did win the first game. Um, and I, I really do think that um, what Kaz drove back into that team um, in her time with us um, is what really got us across the line. Because you, you were so tired after, I think we played eight games in about six days or something. It was crazy. Um, and even when we played Balmain, um, so the best of three, um, you played two games in one day. Um, to, to think that you would play two National League finals games, a grand final in one day, um, if you tell people that now, they'd think you were stupid. Uh, but it's what we did. And you know, I put it down to what she drove into that team with the passion of Cronulla and what it meant to everyone to win. Um, and we had John Davey as coach. And I think he flogged us uh, at training um, and made us do the same things over and over and over again. And when it came to playing, it was just absolute your nature just to do those things because we'd, we'd had it drilled into us and had been flogged at training. So it worked and when we were tired, we knew what to do and it, it all came off together. So, so Maka, you were saying before that um, you, when you broke your thumb and you wanted to play, but they wouldn't let you play. Was that a joint discussion with Cronulla and the Australian staff or just Cronulla or am I looking outside the realm here? How did, how did oh, all... just a conversation from Dumper to me. Okay. I to play. <laughs> Fair yeah. enough. Thank you. Yeah, look, um, as it as it turns out, like um, I still have pain in that that finger, um, so like I could have done more damage to it and been out of the national team for longer. So while I always want to play and I want to play every game I can, um, it it was the right thing to do for my longevity. Um, but, but at the same time, time, at the yeah, time, I'm, no, I didn't want to hear it. <laughs> I think I had about three weeks out, so which isn't a long time, really. Yeah. Mm. Um, but as when you're the number one goalkeeper and you play all game, every game, it feels yeah. like an eternity. Yeah. Mackie, you talk about some injuries that kept you out of international and also the domestic competition. What advice would you give to young or, or not young, I suppose, players that are injured or are trying to get back from injury? Because like whether it was a direct injury, like a broken finger or an overuse one for you, you did have a few and you, yeah. you know, <laughs> yep. And you came back bigger and better every time. So what advice would you give? Um, I guess for you, um, direct injuries, like an impact injury, uh, you've, you've just got to have the time out um, and let things heal in time to come back. And I, I didn't want to do it, so I don't expect any player to want to do it at the moment, um, take that time to heal. But you will be around in the game a lot longer. Um, I've seen people not treat their injuries and they don't ever amount to what they could have been. Um, so I, I would definitely say you've got to let those injuries heal. And the, the overuse injuries, I think it's really important for the younger ones coming through that are starting to get those little niggles to listen to their body um, and, and just rest. Um, sometimes we all need that mental day off or that physical day off, not because you are injured or sick, but because you're about to be. And I don't think we're smart enough at the moment. Um, coaches, players, everyone, I, I really don't think we're smart enough in saying, okay, I'll take a session off or I'll take a couple of days off, get my body better. And when I get back, I'll train harder and faster. Um, I think we just push through, push through way too much. And that's a reason that there's so many injuries at the moment. Can I make it? Oh, sorry. Go on, Kasia. Go on. The silver lining with COVID. So you have to basically not come to training if you are at all sniffly, at all sick. So, you know, I, Maka will attest to this. A lot of us will, will battle through, will come to training when we're a little bit under the weather, not, not thinking we're going to give it to anyone, not wanting to do that, but just thinking, oh, I can't, it's, it's um, in inverted commas, weak to not come to training today. I'm not that sick. Whereas the right thing to do for yourself and the team is, of course, not come to training. So silver lining of COVID, you actually are not allowed to come. So it's, it's yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a really good thing. And I think it hopefully will 
as Maka said, teach us a lesson that, you know, it's, it's either your body saying you need the rest or it's like, you will get injured if you keep going how you're going. So take, take that, um, take this lesson and put it into the future. I think. I think it would be hard to, um, look at the stats from COVID time to non COVID, um, in regards to sickness and injury, because obviously you're not, not everyone is training such high impact. Um, there's obviously not the games and the travel and all of that involved as well, but it would be interesting to see how often people have got sick, um, even in this lower intensity period. Mm. That make a, 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 do you think it's a, a mental scenario that if you don't go to training that the coach might think less of you or if I don't go there, I might lose my spot. And if I lose my spot, I can't get back in. So I'm going to go no matter what. Yeah, I think it's a bit, um, it, it's, it's on us that we don't want to look bad. Um, but I also don't think there's enough support from within teams of teammates. Like I saw that as a coach, as soon as someone, so if, if someone turned up uh, unwell or just under the weather a little bit, mentally not there, I would send them home. And I would see still teammates go, oh, that's a bit unfair. Why do they get to go home or why are they not here? Instead of, yep, they need a break and I hope that they're fitter, happier, healthier come the game or come next training session or whatever it be. So while it is an internal fight with yourself, I also think that because of the nature of the way we've developed our sport in being uh, so competitive between athletes, I think that you also see that in the team environment where you, you don't want to miss a session because you don't want those negative thoughts and feelings coming from teammates as much as the coach. So you're, so from your experience onto coaching, you've gained that, sorry, you've gained that experience about players being sick and you know what it's like. So you don't have a problem to tell them, listen, you're not well, you're under weather, whatever it is, yep. you, you can go. I'd quite often send people home, even if they turned up looking tired. Um, if I knew they had lots of study on or work was just horrendous at that period of time. Um, obviously not. If you had repeat offenders, which I didn't at Sydney Uni, I was really lucky. Um, they had a really good culture um, of turning up to training. But if there was people that I felt needed a session off just because I thought they needed it off, I would send them home. I'd actually ban them from training. Alicia, uh, I don't know if you realise, but we were supposed to land in uh, Israel for World Championships next week. And you've had a bit, bit of experience with Australian level juniors over the last year uh, and what they go through to prepare. Do you think we're pushing our juniors a little bit too much? 100%. Um, I think that the juniors, the timing of when they are trying to make these teams and everything that they're being asked to do. They're, they're, they're fighting for a place in national league teams. Like they're that fringe, uh, not, not the team itself, the 13 that play, but probably, you know, on that scope of being a number in the national league squad. Um, so they're fighting for that. They're fighting for school teams. Um, a lot of them uh, do go to private schools and must attend private school training and things like that also. Then they're in state teams and their um, 16s or 18s coaches want them, plus their grade teams want them. It just seems everyone wants a piece of the pie um, and we, we just push them too hard, too much, all the time. Plus they're trying to do well at school and they're in their final years of schooling. I just, I see it all way too much. So, so Maka, in saying that, now I believe there's going to be an under-16 world champs in the future. What's, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I guess it depends how we're going to look after them. I don't, I don't think we speak to each other enough about what's going on. Um, club coaches, you know, they obviously want their piece of the pie. Are they getting spoken to or about what the training load is looking like from state coaches, from national coaches? Are the school coaches involved in all of this? Um, it's just, I don't feel like there's much communication along the line. Um, I felt it when I was coaching that there was no communication. And because everyone wants their team to do well, 
And, you know, as a coach, you keep your position. If your team is doing well, um, everyone kind of only cares about their situation and not the next person in the line situation. And at the end of the day, there's an athlete involved in this and there's, you know, you got to look at each ind individual athlete and see what they're going through. Some kids need more, some kids need less. Um, but we try and we take, we take them all on as a team um, and don't often look at the individual. I think 16s is probably, I'm not, I don't know where um, age wise everyone does their HSC or the like yeah. for different states, but 16s seems like a better age group to me to be uh, working on a national, uh, sorry, uh, world championships um, than 18s when those final years of school, sure. yep. all of that's happening. So I don't know whether you go from 16s and have a gap and then go again or what you do, but I see it as a better timing than that 18s group where there's just more involvement of school. Uh, it's very hard isn't it, for that age group to to where they where they sit with their studies and school and everything else. So it doesn't have to be. If there, if there was better communication um, and more individual plans um, that all work together to form the the teams and squads, it can be done. Um, yeah. But I just I don't think there's the communication. Yeah, let's get back onto you and your coaching career. Uh, you moved after you played that one season for Sydney Uni. Yep. You were approached by Sydney Uni, or you put your hand up to coach. Uh, the girls asked me actually, uh, would I coach? Um, and then having a chat to Ian, he said to me, he "said Oh, I'm done. Do you want it?" So, um, yeah, it was. I guess you know, um, not having like coming into that team, and they they treated me so well as a member of the team straight away. We're very thankful that I was there. Um, obviously, you know, not, not having a goalkeeper, so they would be very thankful, but um, it was more just, um, I guess I wasn't obviously the goalkeeper that Leah could be. Um, I was more the voice behind them, and that's what they were after, wanting me to um, provide that voice again the following year to coach. So, yeah, that's, that's why I stayed on and, and coached that year after playing. Two years. <laughs> Three years. Well, yeah, after, after the first year, um, I actually got pregnant again with my second. Um, and it was Leah, actually, who said to me, it's an Olympic year, you can't leave us hanging. Uh, so she guilted me um, very easily. I, I do bow down to guilts a lot. Um, so that's how I coached the second year. Um, and then it was actually Danny Morrissey who said to me, well, you can't walk out after winning just one medal. You have to <laughs> you. It's so good at guilting you. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, I got guilted a lot. Um, and then, yeah, I decided that um, three years was enough and it was time to put um, some time into my own children. And that's when uh, I actually travelled Australia for 12 months. So, so Maka, coming from uh, as a player goalie, as we all know you are, and a great goalie, and you said you didn't really notice the referees because they weren't calls against you or whatever. How did that change when you become a coach? Yeah, so I guess I didn't coach um, internationally, obviously, just nationally. Um, and I guess because I was older too and had been around the national team for so long, I knew all the referees, not on a personal level, um, not to where I would feel like as a player, I would never have gone up and spoken to them. Um, but then once I was a coach, I felt like it was my responsibility to start speaking to the referees after games um, and asking questions about why things happened. I mean, I can't change the way my players play unless I know what went wrong. Uh, so I would, if I had ever had any concerns, I wanted to know why something had happened the way it had in a game, I would go and ask questions. Uh, and it was after building that relationship with the referees that I decided I'm going to actually push my players to go and ask the questions. Mm -hmm. Rather than getting them, they were asking me or getting angry with the referees and then just storming off after games, it was, no, well, if you've got a question or you want to know why something's happened, go and ask. Um, and try and develop that uh, player-referee relationship. Because I think the referees are very intimidating. Um, there are some that I feel uh, are entitled 
Um, and then there are some that are fantastic and will go, here's why I did what I did. Um, and I think the more that can actually not turn up as I'm the referee and I'm the one who manages this game and it's all about me, um, those that turn up and go, hey, if I can teach these players how to play better, what the actual rules are, how to interpret the rules, how to play by the rules, then my game's going to be easier. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my refereeing will look better if the players know what is expected of them. Because um, some do it so well. Some really take the time to um, talk to players and really explain the rules um, and giving those players a better understanding. Whereas others, once the game's done there, you're not allowed to touch them, talk to them. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just something that I think if they work on better as referees, mm -hmm. it'll enhance the game. Look, I, I think um, if most rest are approached amicably, they will, I've got no, no doubt, hopefully would, would share the time and, and explain what's going on, hopefully. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, I haven't been around for a few years now, but um, even in my last year, I'd say there was a couple that I didn't find approachable. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I haven't been around. So if that's improved, I think it's yeah. fantastic because it, it's definitely what's needed because referees should know the rules and how to interpret them better than anyone else. Absolutely. Um, and as players, we don't get that education. Um, so if, if the referees can educate players, I think it's only going to make our sport better. So as, as a coach, Macca, and um, a referee makes a decision and the player thinks it's wrong and they spring to the side and they jump out and they argue with you saying, oh, the referee made the wrong decision. But in your eyes, as a coach, you thought, well, no, that, that referee did the right call. Will you tell your player that, that you think they made a mistake, not the referee? Yeah. Yes. So if players would um, go off at the referee, they in my team, they would get dragged. Um, no matter if I thought the referee was wrong or right, it was a, no, we don't speak to referees like that, so you'd be out. Um, if they were kicked out and got out and then mouthing off about what had just happened and I didn't believe what they were saying was correct, I'd tell them so. Um, and I'd say it loud enough for the referee to hear because I'd want the referee to know that I have their back also. Um, but in saying that, if a player was angry about something and I clearly didn't know what it was about or thought it was a bit of a dodgy call, I would really, I'd just turn to my player and go, I've got no idea. So then at least the player and, and loud enough again for the referee yep. to hear so that, you know, the referee can, has the chance to explain to us after the game and I will. I'll, I'll go up and ask after the game what, what it was for. Hmm. Well, that, that's, for me as a referee, that's fantastic to hear that, um, you know, that as a coach, you, you would do that with your players and you, and you would ask your players to speak to the ref or yourself speak to the ref. I think that's a great rapport that we, sh we should have. Yeah, well, <laughs> hey, I don't want to be refing. Um, I'm, I'm terrible. I start watching the game and get cranky at players. So um, I think... Referees don't get paid enough. Um, Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. <laughs> they, they give up their time. Um, you know, th there is no game without a referee. And you yeah. watch the lower grades play with, without referees and it's terrible. Um, yeah. you know, people just jumping on the side of the pool to become a ref that, that game. Um, so we, we definitely need the referees. So I think if we take each other a little and, and take the time to speak to each other and again communicate, then it can only be better. Okay, that's so refreshing. I think we should have you on every week to say that. <laughs> Thanks, Danny. <laughs> no. Okay. Question. I've got a uh, with, the Q &A uh, box, Phil. Question from the Q&A box uh, from Fiona. As a coach, Macca, would you invite a referee to a training session to go through the rules for greater understanding on all sides? Yeah, I would. I would. Um, I've, I've invited uh, referees along to ref. Um, I actually invited a referee, a younger referee, who was an up-and-coming referee to come along to, to gain some experience, but also to get the feeling of what uh, National League players go through. But I didn't do it again because of the way that referee was treated. I had invited another club to come along. Um, against the, the team that I was coaching. Um, and the way that referee was treated that night, 
it kind of put me off um, because I'm only in control of myself and my players. I'm not in control of others. And um, after the way that referee was treated, I thought, I don't want to put another referee in that position again. Um, I guess a senior referee wouldn't be in that scenario because they can look after themselves. But definitely I would um, get a referee to come along and explain things because I think, as I said, no one knows the rules or how to interpret them better than referees because um, you guys all have your own seminars, webinars, all of that kind of thing to, to go over the rules. Alicia, getting back to coaching, uh, with uh, last year we had four females coaching as the senior coach in National League. Uh, this year it looks like with Mel Rippon standing down from Cronulla, looks like there'll only be two, which will be Katie Finnecum at uh, Fremantle and Danielle at Balmain. How do we get more women coaching at the high level, given that Plenty of people put in at junior level, plenty of ladies, uh, experienced water polo players put in at junior level. No one seems to come up and actually stay for a long period at the senior level. Yeah, I guess um, it's all about the support they're given. I mean, not every female that's coaching at the senior level or wants to coach at the senior level has a family um, to look after. But I mean, in my scenario, um, I've got a husband who works shift work, um, so it's very difficult and I have to rely on supports of family to look after the kids if I'm to coach. So that makes it really difficult. Um, and it, it's really time consuming. So there's not just the turning up to training and games. There's the talking to athletes, having meetings with them, having meetings with the club, um, watching video. Like There's so many more hours that go into it than just pool time. Um, so I think it does take away from anyone that does have a family, especially a young family. So I'm sure Danielle will feel that this year, um, having the two um, and, and how she'll juggle that. Um, but she does have the support of family, which is really good. But I don't know. I don't know how, how you get more females to stay around um, unless there, there is that, that support that can be um, given also from outside of family because I, I mean you can't lean on your family all the time either um, but it, it does become difficult when you know the family dynamic you've got husband working off one area and you know wife wanting to coach and kids involved or you know someone like Katie Katie's job um, is really time consuming and takes a lot up and it's hard for her to get time off for work um, but yeah, I don't know that there's the same constraints happen for dads that want to coach too. Um, you know, they want to be home with their children. So it's the same scenario, I guess, but I don't know what keeps females out of it. I can only, I can speak only on, on my story and that's purely, I wanted to be around for my <coughs> a bit more um, cause I was taken away from them so much. Well, uh, Alicia, do goalkeepers make better coaches? Um, oh. I don't know. Um, I think you can know the game well. Um, you see it from a different angle than you have from the whole time you've been playing. But at the same time, you've got to have um, the right philosophy, the right temperament. There's so much more that goes into coaching than just uh, the tactics and your vision. Um, so, yes, goalkeepers make good coaches, but I don't know that they make the best coaches because it's a holistic person that makes the best coach. Maka, do you think, given that the men's and women's game do have differences, that you know female coaches do have advantages in coaching female teams? I mean, I'm not saying that they shouldn't be coaching male teams, but given that you know you have, as you said, watched the female game from the goals, or other potential past players have played in the actual game there are advantages for there to be more female coaches simply because they understand the nuances that potentially, and I've had many great male coaches, and I'm not saying that, but potentially that male coaches um, only can observe. Um, I don't think it means that they know the game differently, that females know a female game differently any more to a male knowing the female game. Um, I think it comes down to... Um, understanding females um, in the female environment, being able to control emotions and um, 
just for instance, knowing when someone turns up to training and they are, they're not themselves. Like what, what is that? Is it that they're tired? Are they unwell? Is it because there's a boy issue, whatever it be. Um, I think honestly, females pick that up better in a female, um, <laughs> mainly because we've been through it. Um, then I think sometimes males don't pick that up as well, but boys are not like that. So when men are coaching men, um, they'll just, boys will punch on if they're grumpy <laughs> or whatever. Um, the girls will cry. Um, yeah, and there's just the differences. And I think it's um, important to have that female touch. So if there is a male coach, there probably needs to be a female assistant coach or manager or someone that's heavily involved um, in the dynamic of the program, not just there for game day or handing out caps or things like that, but someone who's really involved in the team needs to be female on female, I think. Um, just because, just to pick up on those little things um, and to help, um, yeah, just, just make that team gel a bit better, there needs to be a female involved, I believe. Do you agree with that, Phil? Oh, sorry. I, I've, oh, well, as a coach, I've, when I coach women, I've always had a female assistant. Uh, but Balmain's very good at that. Uh, always had a female assistant or actually sometimes two or three assistants. And every time I've gone away of a representative team, my assistant coach has always been a female. This year I had Katie Ann Macker as my two assistant coaches. And they, in our training camps, are doing a lot more than I was doing. And it was terrific. Can I ask you one more question, Macca? Do you think the game has matured enough where institute coaches should be allowed to go and coach? You know, let's say Re Rebecca Rippon's a good example. She's New South Wales Institute coach when she comes back from the Australian team, but she's barred from coaching at any club. You know, have we matured enough where it shouldn't be a problem for her to go and coach at Cronulla? Look, I, mean, I, I look at it two ways. Um, I came through where at times I thought, oh, that's a bit unfair. Um, there's, there's things going on at training that I thought, oh, they get more rest than we do, um, things like that. So I saw it as a player's perspective and I didn't like it. Um, but I think at the same time, if we're going to ask Beck to coach at an Australian level and be able to support Pedrag 100% and if anything was to happen to him, step in and, and be the Australian coach of the, the senior women's national team, she has to be doing coaching. So if she's not, if she's only being an assistant to him and never running something herself, where, like, and, and that's not just, NSWIS is different. It's training sessions. It's for physicality. It's not for the team environment and, and building a team and, coming up with plays and all things like that. Like I 100% I believe that Beck would have it nailed on how to keep a team fit, but that whole team environment, if she hasn't done it for so long, how is she expected to do it if something was to happen to Pedro? So yeah, they need to, they need to be coaching a team and a, a constant team, not just a, a one-off for a week or something like that. It's so vastly different to come in and, and change a team for a week than it is to hold together a group of people over a long period of time. Maka, has the influx of overseas coaches been good for Australian water polo? It hasn't been good for Australian coaches to progress, I don't think. Um, what they've brought um, in terms of what they've learnt from overseas is really good. Um, in terms of people here progressing um, and getting provided with opportunities, I don't think that's been good. So while we need coaches from overseas, bringing everything that they've, they've learnt over there and uh, offering a different perspective and, and things like that, um, we also need to provide a path for... We, we, we keep creating paths for... This is the path for these um, athletes to take to achieve an Olympic dream. Where is the path for referees? Where is the path for coaches? I don't think we've done enough on either of those two. Um, and if we don't progress coaches and referees, then our players will only ever get to a certain standard. Okay. Totally agree. 
well said. Yes, very well said. Now, unless anybody um, has anything else, we'll go on to our opinion segment with me. Maybe you could ask one, one question before we go on to it. Yep. Maka, what what goes through the goalie's head? Let's say you're you're on the bench, okay? Uh, you didn't get in the water at all. Um, the game's a draw. It goes to penalty shootout. You're still on the bench. All of a sudden, the coach says to you, all right, go, go out. You're in. You haven't played the whole game. You've done nothing. What? What goes through your head when a coach says, okay, now you're in? You know what? You need to ask this question to VB because uh, we were at a world championships playing, cannot remember who for the life of me right now. Um, Could have been Italy, but I can't really remember. I played the entire game. Um, Back then, it was also extra time. Okay. Um, VB was chucked in at the end for the penalty shootout. Cold cold as cold could be, and was terrible. Um, and VB's great on a penalty, yes. uh, yep. but was cold as cold could be because it was over an hour since she'd hit the water. Yep. And I obviously warmed up, knowing that I was the <laughs> goalkeeper of that game and would be playing, I warmed up as that. Yep. Um, so she didn't even get as much warm-up prior to the game as I did um, and then was chucked in for the penalties. And, yeah, did, did, did not do as well as what she would usually would. So um, I haven't been in that situation, but she has. So that's definitely a question for her. Um, I guess I'd relish in it. I lo- would love the fact that well, I could be the saviour. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's that's yeah, what that's you weird. want as a goalkeeper, to be that one, that the, the hero. I guess it's the same as any field player wanting to score the winning goal. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it, it's one thing to want it and mentally be ready for it. It's another thing to be physically ready for it. And I'd say Beebs would have loved it, jumping yeah. in and being, you know, potentially being the hero. But it wasn't to be because her body just did not move as fast as she needed to because she was so cold. And I felt sorry for her. It was a horrible situation for her because, yeah, she just, just had nothing when it, you know, in that last... Crunch. Yep. Fair enough. Thank you. Alicia, just one more question from me, if I could. Do you have any aspirations to go on to a higher level of coaching? Um, it's hard living out here. Um, and we chose to live out here. It's a, it's a lifestyle choice uh, where we can afford to, to do what we want. Um, so I don't regret the move out here, but it has taken me away from water polo as such. Um, and I can only really do oh, camps and, and things like that. And I guess you bringing me back in to uh, be with the youth squad was really good. Um, and I, I was really looking forward to that. Um, but it does take me away from, from coaching full time, um, purely because I'm, you know, four and a half hours from Sydney. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit difficult. So at this point in time, I'd say no, no aspirations to go further. Um, but I do want to be involved as much as possible. So whenever I get the opportunity, I try and and jump at it if I can. If I can make it work out here with family um, and the kids getting looked after, then, yeah, I I do jump at it. But I'm not prepared to be living in Sydney, Um, probably even another state, not so much Sydney um, in terms of being in a city. Melbourne. (laughs) Uh, yeah. We're full of COVID. Have you got your Delfina mask? Oh, I do. Would you like me to run and get it? No, I don't want you. I want you to keep talking just for a couple of minutes. <laughs> like, tell us about Canoundra. I mean, I've never been there. It's four and a half hours from Sydney. Yep. So yeah. we are the balloon capital of Australia. Um, so hot air ballooning. So of a morning, uh, Phil, you'd hear the waves rolling in on Bondi Beach. Um, I hear a hot air balloon only a few metres above my roof. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there, anytime it's um, good weather, there's a hot air balloon or 10 up in the sky, which is really lovely. Um, we're a farming community. Um, so right now there are fields of gold, lots of canola around, um, which just sends me sneezing um, all day long. But... Very beautiful. Um, yeah, and then there's cattle and sheep. But, yeah, little little farming community. So it's nice. Nice and safe little community. I mean, the kids can ride to school. 
I mean, they're only, what, five and six and they can ride their bikes to school, no worries. Um, so, yeah, everything's in walking distance. My office is uh, a, a short little stroll. So I can leave work at 2 o'clock and be home by 2.01. <laughs> and, and, and if anyone wants to buy a house there, we just ring you up. Yeah, that's right. If you would like an investment property, I have a few available at the moment, and then I can put someone in to rent for you. How's that sound? Sounds good if it's going to appreciate. How much can we get a uh, three-bedroom house for in Canoundra? Um, you'd be looking anywhere between 250 to 350 for a three-bedroom home. Okay, not too bad. So, so Rent the market here, you, if you've got a three bedroom home, you could ask three, three ten a week. Okay, pretty good. And I thought Danny would be asking this, how many pubs in town? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, um, in terms of drinking holes, there's about five. Um, one pub only opens at 4.30 on a Friday afternoon. Um, so yeah, so the Royal, if you want to go to the Royal, best burgers in town. Um, that's my Friday go-to. And it, yeah, they open, only open at 4.30 on a Friday and they're only open Friday, Saturday, Danny. So, oh, jeez. Yeah. Like there's, like there's four other pubs in there, Mecca. Yeah, there's a couple of clubs, <laughs> you know, RSL, golf club, all those things. And it's rugby league country out there too, Danny. <laughs> well, we've got league and we've got union. Have my got Australian got rules? Union. Sorry? No Australian rules? No Australian rules. Right. Wouldn't even know what that ball looks like, Ian. <laughs> okay. Well, nothing wrong with, with rugby league country, that's for sure. Okay, back to water polo. The opinion piece, I've got it here. We'll do it in order as we've got it. Best female player that you have seen. Let's say goalkeeper. Let's say field player, and then we'll go to goalkeeper. Yeah, wow. I couldn't pick. I really couldn't pick. Okay, that's a that that gets yeah. us going. Well, no, well, I feel like if you pick if you pick anyone over someone else, there's reasons that. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, what about goalkeeper? I really don't know. That too. <laughs> Different people. Do. <laughs> okay, so. what about male player? Don't want to play with us. <laughs> Best male goalkeeper, Alicia. There's been I some good ones. Yeah. Yeah, but as I say, like you can, how do you pick from one era over another era? Well, stopping balls, you know, Michael Turner. Uh, yeah. I, I honestly cannot pick a player over another player. That's like people asking me to pick, oh, is the 2000 team better than the 2020 team? Can you pick a coach? Who you, impressed you? <laughs> Not the best. Good way Not the best. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying hard. God, I mean, how do you go past Adam? Yeah. How, like, how, how do you go past him? Like, the, the girls all good. seem so happy with him. Um, he's got the best Olympic record. How do you go past him? He was a good guest too. Excellent. What about, uh, well, we were talking about female coaches, female, females coaching. Then maybe that's not a, a big enough pool to pick from. No, not really. No. Okay. What I mean, about teammates of note? Oh, Keisha. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. We got an answer. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, again, so... Um, I spent all my free time um, with Bronnie Knox. Um, she was my roommate of selection. Um, I tell you what, uh, we don't do as well as we did uh, in London without Mel. Um, I know she was captain for the Beijing team, but what she brought um, to London was far greater um, as not being the captain. Um, yeah, it's, um, I don't know, there's d different players for different teams, I think, um, because sometimes it's not the best player in a team. Um, sometimes it's just the player who works the hardest, who sits on the bench the best. 
So it's it's really hard to say uh, the best player that I've ever seen uh, or played with. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'd, I'd I'd have to say Mel from from what she's done for me and the times that she was there for me when I needed her to be. Um, it's not to say that um, we always had the best relationship. I mean, we'd yell at each other in the pool. Um, she'd blame me if I didn't tell her the absolute best position to be in. But when it matters, um, we, Dumper actually asked us to fill out um, a form one day to say who we, who we would take to war with us. Um, which, you know, um, when your husband actually goes, you know, off and does those things, you kind of think, yeah, water polo is not war. Um, so it, it, it's a really hard um, one to answer. But if I had to pick one player that I wanted beside me all the time, I'd pick Mel. All right. A referee who has impressed you. <laughs> oh, now I have to say Danny. Hey. I knew you'd do that. <laughs> well, I don't know that you've ever refed me, actually. <laughs> he has. Okay. How do you feel? How about best venue? Best venue. Well, um, I'm, I'm talking about pools here. You know, I thought Phil might be. Australian pools? Sorry? If, uh, Australian pools? Uh, Australia first. Yeah, I do, do both. Australian and international. Yep. Yeah, okay. I loved MSAC um, for World Champs. Um, I thought, mind you, it was freezing. Mm. And I really wanted people to score goals. So they'd do those flamethrower things. <laughs> um, because it was so cold when I was on the bench. Um, but I liked the atmosphere of that. Um, I can't say that, I, that any other pool really gives me that atmosphere. I mean, Bowmain would if it was my home pool. Um, but it's it's never been my home pool. So I feel it's always been intimidating. Um, but it would give that atmosphere, I think. I don't, I don't, there's not really an Australian pool that absolutely blows my mind other than, you know, having world champs at MSAC. Overseas venue? Oh, there's so many European places that I've loved. Um, played the Pythia Cup once in Greece. I can't even tell you where the pool was. It was on a bay, but it was beautiful. Not, not the most lovely looking place, um, but I just, I loved the tournament there. So it always holds a special place. Um, the, big, the big venues don't really do it for me all the time. It's more the little intimate ones that do. Talking about an intimate venue here, do you think Cronulla should be allowed to use Gunnamatta Bay for National League games? Uh, if they did some work to it. I mean, you can't expect Balmain to have done the work that they've done and put in pontoons and all those kind of things unless Cronulla are going to do the same. But, okay. yes, it would be a good atmosphere down there and I think it's better than playing up at Southo. Okay. But it has, has to have work. A lot of people would agree with that. All right, Alicia, it has been an absolute delight chatting with you tonight. Uh, and your insights into uh, water polo and your career have been fantastic. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And uh, that just about brings us to the end of the program, ladies and gentlemen. Phil, Danny, Keisha, and once again, Alicia, thank you very much for joining us. And our next program will be on Monday, September 21. Our special guest is Simon Daly. Who is Simon Daly, Phil? Simon Daly is... Uh, I know, but... ...ex and Swiss uh, QAS coach and runs Academy, uh, Academy Sport. And you should look at their website if you want to know anything what's happening in World Water Polo. Yep, the Academy of Water Polo pops up on your screen uh, every day. And it's a good read. And no doubt we'll be reading it in between now and then. So thank you for joining us, everybody. And we'll see you next time on The Whistleblower. That's Monday, the 21st of September. And thanks again to everybody. We'll see you soon. <laughs>